Welcome to Ask the Therapist, a monthly podcast for everyone who's interested in how our minds work, building resilience through journaling and all things therapy. I'm your host, Sarah Rees, a mental health nurse and CBT therapist with over 20 years of experience in the field of mental health. Hello and welcome to this episode of Ask the Therapist. It's lovely to have you here. I'm so excited to be able to share this month's conversation with you. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Chris Irons. Dr. Chris Irons is a clinical psychologist and an eminent figure in the world of compassion-focused therapy because of his research and help in developing the therapy and his continuing efforts in building Balanced Mind, of which he's one of the directors. He's written a number of fantastic books, two of which I've got here, and they are brilliant for therapists learning about compassion-focused therapy or if you're interested in developing a more compassionate mind and using the knowledge and the research around compassion-focused therapy to just be the best version of you you can be. So he's written um, Difficult Emotions, The Compassionate Mind Approach to Difficult Emotions, and The Compassionate Mind Workbook as well, which he's written with Elaine Beaumont. Um, Both fantastic books. I use them both an awful lot. Will highly recommend them. Today, Chris is talking about his journey into compassion-focused therapy, becoming a clinical psychologist. He's discussing how he met Paul Gilbert and their initial work together and some of the research that he's done over the many, many years he's been in the field, I think over 20. And he's now living in Portugal, still running his business. He does lots of training and he um, does lots of food supervision. And he's expanding everything out to the corporate world as well, which is very exciting. I'm looking forward to knowing more about that. We talk a lot as well about compassionate mind training. So you've heard on this podcast me talk about compassion-focused therapy a number of times, and you can go back and listen to the amazing podcast I did with um, Professor Paul Gilbert, which was just learned so much. It was really insightful. And we now drill down into compassionate mind training, what that looks like, why we do it and how we do it. So I think it's got something for everybody. I thoroughly enjoyed this episode and I know you will too. Look forward to your feedback. Enjoy. So welcome to Ask the Therapist. Thank you so much for agreeing um, to come on today. Um, I'm really excited to chat to you because I think we just meet in passing at conferences. I've been to some of your trainings, obviously, and they've been always been amazing. So it's nice to kind of have a good chat with you. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for the invite. Pleasure. So I wanted to start because I know you're very well known in the world of therapy, but I suppose I'm curious about kind of how it all started. I always think that choosing to be a therapist as a career is is a bit odd. (laughs) You know, it's a strange path to go into. So I'm just curious about how you made that decision, you know, how it kind of started for you and meeting Paul Gilbert and and all that good stuff. Yes, Um, I think it's a great question. It is so interesting, isn't it, just to kind of find out and see how people get into the flow of all of this. I mean, mine had, I guess, two different versions, really, or two parts to it. The first part was a kind of, I guess, in the CFT-like language, the social shaping side of things. Uh, The vast majority of my family uh, were in the helping professions one way or another. Um, And so I kind of grew up seeing family members who were uh, teachers and firefighters and social workers. And so it was kind of around me that it was important to try to contribute and, I don't know, sort of help people and society. Uh, My grandfather moved to the UK, uh, settled at the end of the Second World War. So he was from Jamaica and he dedicated his life to um, uh, basically to helping people with race relations. Uh, he got an OBE for his uh, work in helping uh, West Indian and uh, Indian and Pakistani communities in particular in Nottingham in the East Midlands. Uh, so he was just this amazing figure who basically if I look at it now, had compassion at its heart, really. He was focused on people who were suffering a lot and people were experiencing lots of prejudice. And he dedicated his life, commitment and courage and a lot of wisdom to, to try and do his best to help people. So, you know, I kind of grew up really lucky having these inspirational figures around me. And so I guess that was the first nod towards, I guess, being a psychologist, a therapist, and, and I guess also a nod towards compassion without kind of knowing it at that time, but recognizing 
Uh, so many people were really intent on trying to be helpful for people, caring for people, alleviating distress. And so when I then went to university, uh, I was taking uh, psychology. I happened to go to a university where there was a four-year degree. And the th- uh, third year was uh, on work placement. And so when I was, uh, albeit somewhat disorganized uh, at the time as uh, uh, being a young undergraduate and having far too much of a good time at university and uh, partying and so on, when I finally got around to trying to organize uh, where to go for my placement, uh, I had left it kind of late and there weren't many options left and I was really struggling to find something. And and through serendipity, really, a friend of mine, a a good friend who lived on the same road uh, road as mine when I grew up, I was around at his house in the summer holidays, sort of saying, well, I've got to get this thing done and I don't know where to go. And his dad was back from work and it happened to be that his dad was a GP. And his dad said, you know, would you like me to have a look into it? So I said yes and kind of then forgot about it. And I got this phone call from his dad a week later saying, I've never met this guy, but there's a a professor in Derby called Paul Gilbert. uh, And I've heard fantastic things about him. Why don't you write him a letter and see whether he might be uh, willing to take you for a placement? So I wrote this letter to Paul, you know, saying, can I come along? And so anyway, I went along and had this uh, uh, interview with Paul. And uh, essentially, that's where it all started, basically. You know, I kind of loved, I met him and his wife, Jean, and their research unit there and uh, managed to uh, you know, find a way through the interview. Uh, I remember one stage he asked me, uh, so you really want to be a clinical psychologist then? And I didn't know what a clinical psychologist was. I mean, I had a few ideas, but I didn't really know. But it was one of those questions that maybe some of you will know. You, that 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 you, you know, you have to say yes. And um, so I nodded away, absolutely. Uh, and then that started me meeting Paul, basically, and my pathway into CFT, because I had a a year-long placement with him, and it's fair to say it was it was transformational. So this was in 1999, so gosh, 24 years ago now, and it was wow, just this amazing. Year. So it, was, it would have been right at the kind of the early start of it all, was it? Yeah, absolutely. So this was way before I kind of learnt any other real models in terms of clinical psychology or therapy. This was the first thing I got, and what was so amazing for me was that I got to see psychology done in, in an applied way so I would uh, you know be talking to Paul about these research studies that he was looking into shame and attachment theory and self-criticism and compassion and so on and then we would have the questionnaires I'd go and interview uh, people with a variety of psychological difficulties and you know spend time with them and understand about how they were scoring and how they were feeling and then we'd come back and enter it into the computer and then kind of getting statistics out and data out, I was like, oh, that makes complete sense to me because I spoke to this person and I remember them telling me this about their early life and how they felt ashamed. And so suddenly it was almost like, here's real world people, real world ideas, real world theories all coming together. And so I absolutely loved uh, that year. It really helped me to click then in the final year when I went back to university, everything just made sense. I was really just on it in terms of understanding and loving psychology and then Paul uh, offered me to go back to the research unit to do uh, a part-time PhD with him but also to be a a research psychologist so when I graduated so I jumped at his offer and went back so I had another three years there with him working again on some of the early studies on sort of CFT related uh, um, uh, ideas and we published in 2004 a great paper on compassion focused imagery so it was kind of one of the first if not the first it wasn't really like an outcome CFT study, but more just if we guide people through compassion-focused imagery, what happens to them, what are their reactions, what images do they bring? And then it was from there that I then went on to train uh, at Sheffield for my uh, my doctorate in clinical psychology, but I didn't let uh, uh, Paul escape from me. So I went back and had a couple of years on, on placement. So I now had Paul, instead of him being academic professor version of him, I had him as clinical psychology supervisor version. So that's when we were, yeah, he was supervising me doing lots of great CFT stuff. And so, yeah, it was just a wonderful experience really, Sarah. And that that bit of being lucky enough to meet Paul to see both the academic science research version, but also this amazing clinician who was just, wow. I mean, my mind was blown really and that this could be me, that, that I could have a, a, a job going forward as a therapist who could, do these types of things potentially and be inspired like I had been from Paul and, and help people and alleviate their distress, but also that I could be involved in research and, and writing and that side of things, which I absolutely love too. So 
I, I do look back at him. I was so, so lucky, but he was, yeah, such an inspirational uh, figure, really, in terms of, you know, where I've got to and, and this whole compassion focused therapy thing. It's uh, What an incredible it's journey. What what was it that you think initially resonated with you with compassion focused therapy? What? Well, I think one of the bits from as a psychologist, I guess one of the interesting bits was Paul always saying, as you know, you know, we're interested in the sciences. And so the fact that this was linked to attachment theory, the fact that you had this evolutionary underpinning, the fact that Paul had been talking about physiological processes for decades, the fact that there was this wonderful research on shame and self-criticism. And and so what I loved about this was that in a way from my psychology degree, I was able to integrate so much of what I've been learning in a kind of abstract theoretical way. And here's somebody who's actually doing this live and pulling this together in this, you know, obviously therapy that would be go on to be called compassion focused therapy but you know this wonderful kind of scientifically orientated approach that I could really get my head into and then I guess the other bit was having spent lots of time with people uh, um, you know doing some of the research projects and so on and really just seeing the huge psychological distress and beginning to see how compassion could be this potential antidote to helping people to meet their distress and to alleviate it and and then I think probably the bit and which is why I mentioned about the the sort of family shaping bit, I kind of found this thing in compassion and then, you know, sort of reading about it and talking to Paul about it and, you know, developing stuff on it. So it resonated with me so much because I could really see my family in, in compassion. I could see that essentially it was this driving force, even if people hadn't been labeling it as this, that had been guiding so many of my relatives. And, and then it also had this just larger quality to it that outside of mental health problems, it kind of felt that if we've got 8 billion people on this planet at the moment, one of the only things that all of us will share is that we're all experiencing suffering and distress throughout our lives. And the fact that compassion is about and for that, it's about and for, as you know, the connecting the suffering, alleviating suffering. It was just, you know, really clicked for me that, wow, this is working it's with people. Really on the a real personal journey, isn't it? As oh, well, exactly. Because like, I supervise on the diploma and I think a lot of them kind of become surprised as their eyes open and they think, oh my God, I struggle with shame, I struggle with guilt. And, and it's that they go kind of through this journey of applying it to themselves, which I know I certainly did as well. Absolutely so. And I think, you know, that, that moment of realising, say, with the definition of compassion and CFT, sense of sensitivity to suffering of self and others with this commitment to to relieve it you you hold that in line and I think actually this is the definition of really what a therapist's job is I mean the definition of compassion basically is what we do as therapists we're trying to engage in client suffering we're trying to find ways to help them to learn how to alleviate it and the fact that this is actually the definition of compassion just then married in so nicely to this desire then to be a psychologist, to be a therapist, and to, I guess, to be doing what we're doing. Uh, and where are you now then in your life? It looks, and I've heard you moved to Portugal, is that right? Yes. So I guess uh, maybe an act of compassion uh, for myself and for my family was to take that courageous leap to try something a little bit different and uh, to move out to Portugal. And, and I've absolutely loved it, Sarah, because for me, as much as I loved uh, living in London and, and uh, doing a lot of the work there, I did appreciate that London in a way fed my drive system in a way that I could easily just get caught up in working really, really long hours and just into that sort of hectic nonstop lifestyle that, that London, I think, propagates. And Whilst I loved that when I was younger, <laughs> getting older and having a young son and all the rest of it, it felt like actually having an external environment that might allow me to slow down a little bit more and have a bit more of a balance between a uh, drive system and, I guess, slowing down a soothing system might be a good thing. So, uh, so yeah, that was partly what, uh, what prompted the, the, the choice to move. Oh, that's amazing. And what does your working week look like now? What, what are you doing at the moment? Well, I guess because of COVID uh, and everyone kind of getting used to online working, in some ways, things have stayed the same for me as they were in COVID. I guess the thing that I love the most about my job is that it's so varied. So I still see uh, uh, clients uh, each week. So I still have a, a decent caseload. I do lots of supervision. I maybe supervise 10 people a week. I do research. I do writing. Uh, try to come up with new ideas and ways to get these ideas across to people. We have to, uh, we run our, our business, uh, uh, Balanced Minds, and there's another business that I've uh, uh, set up and we're 
about to start launching, which is about compassion in organizations. So there's lots of things that I'm staying busy doing and trying to stay out of trouble, but also having that nice balance of, you know, being able to be out in a beautiful environment and be by the sea and have a nice glass of Portuguese wine now and again. So (laughs) That sounds so nice as as I sit here in near Manchester and obviously it's drizzling, you know, (laughs) sunshine. It makes such a difference, the environment, doesn't it? That's yes, really nice. Nice. The whole thing of uh, being in nature has become something which I really appreciate. And being by the sea and by the cliffs uh, very much helps me to put into my soothing system and to ground and slow down and connect mindfully with what's going on around me. So, yeah, I'm I've really just moved um, about two years ago now. It feels like we've just moved, but um, just only 10 miles away, but more into the countryside. So, there's more walks and local farm shops and it makes such a difference I mean I think I was the noise and the traffic before and now it's like just quiet and calm. yeah I, I, I was lucky enough to see uh Kristen McEwen um who I knew from way back with Paul uh because she uh took uh over my job when I went to my clinical training and Kristen as you probably know doing some wonderful work on uh uh compassionate mind training and forest bathing um oh, and some yeah. amazing amazing stuff of how to combine these things together and of course how much evidence is emerging now linking this in a way to the soothing system uh, and just how we can actually get sort of imagined versions of this through complex imagery and you know connecting with soothing with and breathing but of course externally being able to connect with nature and sounds in a very grounded way so uh, I'm really excited about some of the developments in CFT and, and how there are amazing people doing fantastic work in so many different areas now. It's uh, it's so exciting. Yeah, it's a very exciting time, isn't it? And I'm over the last year, I've been supervising on the diploma and I've got your book here, which is like all the students have got it. It's They absolutely love it. Um, so thank you for this. I, I use it an awful lot with the, the practices. It's a very practical um, guide. Um, and you talk a lot about compassionate mind training do you can you tell us a bit more about that and do you think we can really train our chimp brains that cause so much havoc in our lives yeah I think one of the bits that I love about CFT and of course you know both of us are very biased here but um, one of the bits I love is that we've got this beautiful you know psychotherapeutic process which of course includes a therapeutic relationship transference and counter-transference psychoeducation and all sorts of wonderful things that we would do as a broad about bit of being a therapist but what I love in CFT is that we do have this distinct bit of compassionate mind training that you know as you know can be part of that flow of compassion focused therapy but I also love it that anyone anywhere in the world can uh, engage in compassionate mind training practices and potentially benefit from it so this has always been something that's really stood out to me that here we've got a set of mind and body trainings that you know, the evidence keeps on increasing that can be super helpful for people. So I love that bit about CFT because for me, then it lends itself both to working in a, a, I guess, a very sort of intense psychotherapeutic way in a room with, uh, with one of my clients or in a group. Or, of course, it allows me to think about, well, how can we get these ideas and spread them to kids in school or to just anyone working in an organization or anyone full stop who might want to become a bit more aware of their threat system know how they can be in the presence of it know how they can bring a compassionate flavor to things so I I think for me this range that CFT has then in its applicability from from in a way the real deep end of psychological pain and distress you know some of the worst things that can happen to human beings but all the way to the other end of the dimension where it might be that Somebody might not be particularly struggling with psychological distress at all, but they're just keen to see if they can develop a more caring and empathetic relationship with themselves. And so for me, Sarah, that that's always felt like such a wonderful gift that Paul and the CFT community has sort of provided. And so from that side of things, then CMT has always stood out to me. And, and I guess the intriguing thing for me has been, uh, and I guess whenever I'm teaching, I'm always trying to remind people that, of course, none of these things are sort of panaceas you know there are no panaceas in the world there's nothing that's going to be a pure all or anything that's going to be perfect but the fact that actually on on an individual level and also collectively we might be able to engage in some of these practices which I guess help fundamentally for us to be as human beings with our tricky brains 
Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that we don't choose so much of this, the fact that we have this chaotic mind and bodies that through no fault of our own can cause a huge uh, heap of distress for ourselves and others. It, the fact that we've kind of got a model that which is steeped in wisdom about what it is to be human that sort of takes into account the fact that actually so much of this stuff you didn't choose to have, the brain that can think like this or feel like this, but actually then that there might be uh, a variety of exercises that we can engage in which have a, a very long history, uh, you know, going back to contemplative traditions and so on, but that we've been able to hone and adapt in such a way, I think is fantastic because for me then it gives personally, but also for the people I try to support with it, they said actually, well, we have got options here. There are things that we can do not to somehow escape the fact that our minds, as you say, are chaotic, but the fact that actually embraces that, that gets close to the reality of that, that can see into the nature of this. And rather than blaming ourselves, sort of step back from shame, but also learn to take responsibility that this, if my mind's like this, well, what can I do? Uh, what's what's going to be helpful? And so I think there's something that's very um, inspiring about that. There's something which I, I think because it means then that you're not trying to do this to somebody else. This is something that we try to embody. You know, I have a tricky brain, just as you were saying earlier, that you do and how hard this can be to be human. That yeah. resonates so powerfully with me and, and a recognition that so much of, I guess, why I've also loved CFT is is definitely about myself, what I've been able to learn about myself, how I've been able to engage my own tricky brain, my own threat system, the difficulties that, you know, that I face and that I carry as a human being with my shaping history, the fact that I've been able to turn inwards and, and utilize these kind of practices with the support of others, I, I think has just been such a powerful thing. And so it gives you then that inspiration to want to uh, provide more opportunities for other people to be able to do that. And that's partly why I say with the workbook or with the, the self-compassion app or some of these other things, it's been in a way, how do we get these ideas out of the therapy room? Because although I love being a therapist, you know, the reality is that I have a very limited range of how many people I can help. I'm always limited to the number of hours I've got in a week and, you know, how many clients I can see. Whereas if we can take these ideas and if I can find ways to spread them as much as possible to as many people as possible, then that's something which maybe in the last five, six, seven years I've been really motivated about and it's really been guiding my, I guess, this this portion of my career to see if I can find ways to try to make this more accessible for people. It, it feels like this should be a really standard module in school, doesn't it? If it, you know, I don't know if we ever get there because our brains are so tricky. They don't come with an operational manual, do they, at all? They're quite outdated for the world we live in. And, you know, we just have to get on with things. Yeah. And again, I love the facts, you know, as, as you know her well, people like Mary Welford and, you know, some wonderful other colleagues, my father Matthoff and, and others who are just out there doing fantastic work compassion in schools and, and then for me it's thinking well okay so we've got the schooling system we've got all these you know we, we spend you know apart from sleeping we spend more time at work than doing anything else so mm -hmm. if we could find a way to begin to bring these ideas these practices and, and the idea of compassion organizations and leadership into you know into people's lives in different ways that they could access it I think this just suddenly makes you feel like wow potentially and I again not in yeah, the yeah. agenda for workplaces is really changing, isn't it? I, I have a lot of um, clients that are actual business owners as well, and I've gone into a number of businesses delivering the three systems model that because it applies individually, but to the organisations as well. And it's just starting to change the way we talk about our minds. It's it's yeah, it's definitely coming. I think so. Yeah. I think so. It's as you're saying, really, a way to talk about our minds and body and understand them and deshame them. And, uh, but then also this sort of set of practices which are a way to begin to cultivate a compassionate mind but then the bit similar to you so that I love is you know then working with organizations it's thinking about well how can we then on a, a more sort of contextual uh, level begin to try to cultivate something which will support people in doing their day-to-day -day jobs which of course can be very stressful and you get a lot of drive system stuff so how do we cultivate an environment then so I I've always loved, I guess, as a, another point back to CFT and why, why I loved it, will always talk to me, you know, from those 20 odd years ago about biopsychosocial processes. And what really struck me about Paul was that when he talks about biopsychosocial, he really means it. Like some therapeutic approaches that I've come across, which I think are wonderful, they say, oh, we're a biopsychosocial approach, but then they never really speak about biology. <laughs> they never really talk about or try to bring change to social dynamics and so on that actually focused on psychology which is fine 
But I guess what I found important in the CFT was a, a truly biopsychosocial approach. And as you know, so many research studies have been published on looking at the underlying physiology and biology of what's going on that can facilitate and inhibit passion and you know what shame does and self-criticism in the body and brain. Uh, and but then also, of course, this whole big lean towards how do we bring change to compassionate change to society? You know, yeah. could that be schools? Could this be organizations? Could this be politics? And so the fact that actually that's something which is held within the CFT community for me again resonates so strongly because it really feels like this interaction between the three is so key. So so yeah, I guess another reason why I love this this work that we get to do. Yeah. And when you start working with somebody out doing the compassionate mind training. What are the benefits you start to notice with people? What do people notice well, if they start doing this work? Well, I guess one of the things that I guess I, I will say maybe on the whole for people, but also for myself is one bit, I guess, is almost like a, a becoming more familiar with mind and body, of course. But uh, that, that process, I guess, of, of becoming aware of, uh, becoming more familiar of the flows of our minds and the complexity of them. Uh, I, I think it's such a beautiful thing and, and because in a way engaging in that and being able to see and, and, and see into a little bit more clearly rather than necessarily being dissociated or it kind of being in the periphery of your vision you kind of know maybe you're stuck in a worry loop or a self-critical loop but not fully conscious of it or alternatively you're so over connected with it that you can't see anything else so it's completely occupying your full view so this ability i guess mindful awareness to be able to sort of step back and to look in and to be able to see from a, a grounded position and just become more familiar in a less threat-based way in a less judgy way that i can just observe for me then is this beautiful bit because then if i can combine that and i guess what other people have said now that actually i can have some stability in looking into you know my mind and what's going on and then i've got this psychoeducation which can begin to help me to understand that it's not my fault that all of us have these tricky brains that you know, the threat system, for example, has emerged and we've been bestowed with it. And of course, it, it's designed to be helpful, but it can be very difficult to regulate. All of these wisdoms then can begin to filter through because now I'm becoming more familiar with my mind. I can see that I didn't choose to have these things. It wasn't of my choosing. I can see how and why our minds are like they are. So I feel less shamed. I can see my mind's like your mind, Sarah, that, okay, well, have some differences, but there's lots of similarities. And then having that next bit to think about, well, in the face of some of this stuff, then what might help me further then to be able to ground, to be able to tolerate being in the presence of this, but also then, of course, to be able to bring something which I think is, is uh, uh, so powerful, really, which is a, a caring, supportive internal relationship. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I often share and I've been saying it for years, uh, I guess, as others have, is that wonderful moment where you realize that, you know, all the time you've spent in relationships over your life, all the hours that you spent with friends and family and colleagues. I mean, if you add up every single hour that you're in relationship with others, it comes nowhere close to how many hours that we're in relationship with others. And, and then you see the irony, which is, but first of all, what relationship do we tend to have with others? Do we treat ourselves with the same empathy, kindness, and care that we do our best friends and loved ones, which typically is no, but then Secondly, this whole thing, just the sheer amount of time we're in relationship with others. And when have we been taught how to relate to ourselves, how to relate to our minds? And it goes back to your wonderful point earlier. Gosh, if we could just teach kids this at a younger age. I mean, they get taught amazing things at school, but how can we not teach them this most important thing, which is the one relationship you're really, really going to have to need to be be with and to be skillful and wise to is is how you are with you and so I, that bit then suddenly just uh, and many of my clients I had someone just last week who was saying it's just it's mind-blowing really when you begin to realize that I can have this relationship with myself and that actually just as I can be a good friend to others I can learn how to be like this with myself uh and and somebody's saying to me this is this is mind-blowing I, I, I've never thought about it like this before so there are actually things that I can do, like going to the gym and building my muscle strength. I can do this in terms of being with me and being with my pain. And, you know, that kind of moment then of, of recognition and the, the utility then of being able to engage in compassionate mind training to facilitate all of those steps. Of, of course, not one thing always lands with all people, but the fact that that's something that actually I can take responsibility for, it's something that I can begin to learn. I think, uh, you know, the types of responses when people really land with this are very, very powerful. 
Yeah, absolutely. It takes time, doesn't it? It's like a muscle building it up. You had like learning to play the piano, but I think, you know, you see people really transform and get so much more psychologically resilient and and things just settle for them. And the people listening to this are going to be a mix of people who are interested in psychology, mental health, and then lots of therapists as well that are interested in compassion-focused therapy. And if there was a bit of a plan to get started with compassionate mind training, what would what would be step one, two, and three that you know that you would? Well, I think it's a good question, and, and as you were sort of saying in a way, because people are so different, people need different things. I always love the kind of physical health analogies because I don't know whilst for somebody getting physically fit, they would love to go swimming. For another person, that would be the worst thing you'd ever suggest. You know, they can't swim, they would sink, they would drown, so they would hate it. And whereas other people love running, you know, for many of us, the idea of running is like, could not be a worse way of doing this. So finding the right version, I think, is a really intriguing thing for me. What are the different things that help people to connect with, whether that's the combination of practices, how they're approaching them, how long they spend doing them, whether they do it sat in a a sort of on a cushion or in a chair doing a quiet meditation or whether they're doing I guess that whole idea of uh, sort of mindfulness without meditation or doing practices as they go along in life so the creativity that can come but but I guess for me the you know the sort of stepping stones that there were going to be three broad stepping stones in really I guess I would have and, and often I would uh, subgroup them like this. I, I guess the one, the, the first thing I guess would be a version of mindfulness and awareness training. So mm-hmm. can we help people to become attentive and aware of, of their minds, of themselves, of their feelings, of their tricky brains? So that sort of familiarization and becoming more attentive and, and, and I guess stable in the sense that there's some attentional stability that could be practiced. I think a next bit then would be how people can cultivate their soothing system. And in particular, I guess that bit about slowing down, grounding through soothing rhythm breathing, and just that sense that actually the breath is such a powerful device for it and and how we can begin to feel that we can rest in the soothing system and bring it online to help us to, I guess, stabilize in the face of uh, a threat system. and, And I guess in the face of drive system as well, so that, bit like that analogy of the tea, uh, the tree with deep roots you know remain standing resolute through a storm there's something about cultivating our, our soothing system our capacity to feel safe to be able to feel content and so on and then I guess the third bit for me as a stepping stone then would be into the more direct cultivation of the compassionate mind and in particular I guess you know using the compassionate self or the compassionate other as a vehicle to have the wisdom, the, the strength and the caring commitments to, of course, to learn to how to be with others and to receive compassion for others, but crucially, of course, to be the vehicle, the part of self through which we can start directly utilizing and developing a, a self-compassionate relationship. So broadly, in my mind, those sort of three different areas feel like they're the sort of ideally the stepping stones. And I guess for me, then it helps me to sort of think about which stage are we at with somebody? How are they getting on with the first step with mindfulness and stability of attention? You know, what else might we do before then moving on to the second phase? And it gives me a little bit of a, a gift a map, a guide uh, to, to where I'm at and how they're getting on. Yeah, and it sounds straightforward, but it's not, it's not that it's easy, not. is it? It takes work. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I say to sometimes, I think I'm better how I kind of talk about it now, but we introduce mindfulness and people can roll their eyes and go, oh, here we go. But once you understand the science, and I mean, it's like we all need to be doing the science is phenomenal, isn't it, around it? So it's understanding it more. But there are blocks that come up and sometimes it's it's not easy sometimes to do the things that are really good for us, you know, and what kind of, what comes up for people? And, well, I think it's a lovely point that you're making. So I think the science bit is really useful sometimes, of course, to have the evidence for why this is important. But there's also the question of, of, of why am I doing it in the first place? And so I think one of the nice things about TFT for me is that we've kind of got direct psychoeducation, which will help with all three of those steps. So as you know, um, you know, the psychoeducation about the tricky brain and how easy it is for us to get caught up in these loops in the mind, knowing that once people have been exposed to that, you know, how do we help you with your tricky brain? How do we help you with the fact that you can get caught up in worry and rumination, self-criticism? Well, there's a thing called mindfulness. 
And mindfulness is so ideal because, of course, many of these loops in the mind are about the future or about the past or, or whatever, whereas you're not actually in the here and now. And so mindfulness, the, the reason why we're going to do this, for me, feels like it's really important. And it's partly about, well, scientifically, this can be really helpful for you, but it's linking it to the fact that we all have these tricky brains. So this is a direct link. Now, that doesn't stop then people going on to have difficulties in doing it, but at least there's a rationale for doing it. The same with, I guess, cultivating the soothing system. You know, here's these three systems. What do you know about each of these? Are they familiar to you? Which do you feel that maybe you're spending more time in? And how might we go about balancing things? Well, for most of us, of course, we can kind of see if we draw them out, that the soothing system is really small. So then I can say to people, so look, what do you think we're going to help you to do in, in therapy then? Or what are we going to help you to do? And people can see, well, probably I need to get the threat system a bit smaller, but I also need to grow the green. So I love this bit in which there are kind of psychoeducation and clear pathway into it. But, you know, people will still struggle because as you say, the reality is I can know something as in it's good to go to the gym. I can know, for example, that it's probably good not to eat too many crisps or chocolate or ice creams or whatever. It doesn't mean that it's easy not to do those things. So um, I think coming back to motivation is such an important thing and recognizing what gets in the way of any of our uh, uh, sort of healthy motives. So becoming aware of that, recognizing that it is hard work, but it's not easy. If it was easy, all of us would be doing these things. We wouldn't have problems with fitness and health and all the rest of it. And the reaction, of course, is, or the understanding, of course, is that if we can help you to see what's getting in the way of this, then, of course, we've got a little bit of a better chance to see what's going to be helpful. And so I have always really appreciated the, the sort of fears, blocks and resistances to compassion idea, because then, of course, what it's doing a day is legitimizing that, you know, this is a common thing. I always love that idea. And I often say when I'm teaching and sometimes sharing with people, you know, that a phenomena is common in life when a psychologist develops a, a questionnaire to measure that thing. And so the fact that there's a questionnaire called the fear of compassion scale kind of gives a bit of a nod towards the fact that this is common, this is difficult. Uh, Paul and colleagues are working on a fear of mindfulness scale at the moment, as you oh, might know, Sarah. So, you know, again, the fact that people are developing a questionnaire like this shows that there are key things that get in the way for people to be able to do this. And I guess our job is, for me as therapists is, can I support you in, in working out what is inhibiting your pathway towards doing this and once I get a bit of a clarity on that I've then got different options to try to help you because there's a difference between you know I, I there's a general block to my motivation to do these practices maybe I don't deserve it maybe I'm not worthy maybe you know those types of things I'm too busy in life to actually I, I want to do these things and I try to do these things but as I begin to do them it scares me I start to hit upon difficult feelings uh, thoughts or experiences flashbacks so beginning to then guide people to say, okay, given it's this pattern that's making this hard, let's have a think about what's going to be helpful then. And so yeah. I always find that process then, uh, and I guess as you well know as well, you know, for me, particularly when I'm teaching, you know, that whole bit where we can get across to people saying, you know, the fear of compassion, the fears, blocks and resistance is compassion, they are the work. They this are. is likely to happen, but this is to be expected and in a way not to get worried about it the fact that actually if you kind of know that it's likely to turn up it's more than about how can we understand them and how can we support you with them rather than oh shit you know what's happening here this is terrible the person's struggling no 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 it's okay it's all right it's a little bit like uh you know going back to the physical health analogies if you, if you go, haven't been going to the gym and you go to the gym for the first time and you're on the running machine or whatever and you've just been doing a minute and then you start to get out of breath if you thought, oh my God, this is what's happening to my body. I'm about to have a heart attack. This is terrible. Of course, you're going to stop. You're going to panic. You're going to think this is terrible. Of course, you're not want to, going to continue. Whereas if you have the wisdom to know to get physically fit, you're going to get out of breath. Yeah. That's part of it. That's yeah. okay. It's needed. It's required. But how do we help you to do it so that the level of you getting out of breath is appropriate to your level of fitness and so that we can help you to do it in stages? For me, that just feels like a beautiful comparison, really, to working with fears, blocks, and resistances. You know, some people have very powerful ones. Some people have uh, very little when it comes to it. But if we're aware of them and think about, okay, in a way, there's exposure-like stuff going on here. How do we reassure you and find that level that's roughly within your fitness range that just sort of takes you to that edge without overwhelming you, but also getting your system going a little bit? How yeah. can I support you and reassure you to be able to do that?
and allowing it to be clunky and uncomfortable and and a road yeah exactly well do you do a practice what are your favorite practices or what does that look like for you yeah but I try to um go in between doing the more sort of formal practices and then the sort of informal you know as I'm doing daily life um and I got to a stage where I actually uh can't say I'm perfect at it but I'm much better these days at kind of knowing what I might need at different times. So, for example, if I'm walking along the coast here at lunchtime, mindfulness of sounds, mindfulness of vision, just being in the present moment, you know, is so grounding for me and so powerful. So if I go for a half an hour walk, mindfulness is absolutely my friend. And then what I might do also then walking is also just be very aware of my posture and see for a portion of that time and I just embody my compassionate self can I almost just step into this version and have this sort of embodied compassionate self practice so I find things like that really helpful because I'm going for a walk anyway and you know there's so many wonderful things that can just tune me into skills training at that time yeah. so I appreciate that in those moments I also know uh, these days when I start to get in my threat system and how it shows it in my breathing and how much my breathing is at the top of the chest, it's quite shallow. So being able to notice that slow down and just to engage in soothing rhythm breathing, whether I'm watching the TV, having a conversation with my wife or just, you know, doing a piece of uh, writing on, on my computer, I can just slow down my breathing. If I want to, I can have a bit of a visual guide that just anchors me to maybe some sounds just to guide me on the pace of breathing. So I find that something super helpful just to ground myself, slow myself down. But when I know that I'm facing something which is a bit hotter in my threat system, when I know this uh, almost like scaling wise, I'm kind of more up to the six out of 10 or seven out of 10s or higher, then for me, absolutely, I'm more into doing uh, compassionate self or, or compassionate other, because I kind of know at those moments, I need something which is really going to be able to meet my threat system and be able to ground me and, and help me to first of all, tolerate whatever's going on, but also then give me access to, I guess, wisdom to be able to look into this and to, to think through from a different mind state, I guess, about whatever was triggering it. So I guess over the years, I, I felt that I kind of got a like an idiosyncratic pattern of, of practices that I kind of utilize at different stages, depending on what's happening to me. That's fantastic. And you've developed an app, haven't you? The balance Is it Balance app? Can you tell us a bit about that? And I guess this is a really yeah. good tool if people want to get started with it. Yeah, so um, it was actually, a, there, there was an app company called uh, uh, Psychological Technologies and, and their idea was to take self-help books mm -hmm. and to transform them into apps, which just sounded amazing and it made so much sense. Uh, I just thought it was one of those ideas that I wish I'd had. Um, and they had got in contact with Elaine Bowman and myself uh, because they'd read our Compassionate Mind workbook and they absolutely loved it. And they thought this would be a perfect uh, opportunity to translate this into an app. So we started working with them and, and uh, ended up developing the Self-Compassion app. So essentially, as far as we're aware, it's the first uh, CFT and the first sort of uh, compassion oriented standalone app uh, uh, on the market. And, and we literally took the Compassionate Mind workbook and we took, I don't know, it's like 110,000 word, words in the workbook, uh, over 28 chapters. And our task with the Self Compassion app was to have 28 uh, uh, sessions, but the max of writing, I think, for any session had to be 500 words. So wow. suddenly we could find ways of just really condensing, you know, I guess sometimes complex ideas into something which was relatable, engageable and, and easy to access. And, and it was a wonderful challenge. And what we loved about it in a way was that, you know, here's something which people could in a briefer way get uh, psychological concepts or ideas. And at the end of each course session, there was going to be a practice. Um, and so we wanted it to be really accessible, but also pragmatic and practical for people in which as the sessions went on they could build into their compassionate mind and then end some of those sessions uh, later on so sessions 21 onwards in things like working with the self-critic and multiple selves and you know getting deeper into some of the more uh, tricky uh, practices and engaging a threat system so it was a wonderful exercise for us we really really loved doing it uh, we loved the fact that you could read the sessions or you could just listen to somebody reading it out so you've got those dual uh, modalities and that within the app in one place 
You've also got a, a button you can click for tools where you've got all the major practices that are there. So whenever you want them, you can just click and, you know, five seconds later, there you are guided with a practice. We had short versions of the practices, so like five minutes, but then longer versions of sort of 10 minutes plus, so depending on your time and what's most helpful for you. And so we've been really, I have to say, of all the things that I've done in my career, I think, you know, the books and some of the other things, this is the thing that I'm kind of most proud of. Um, and so we've been really, really pleased with the feedback. We've got therapists getting clients to use this alongside their therapy sessions, but we've just had some wonderful kind of feedback really from people who have just outside of therapy, they found their way to the app and have yeah. been, you know, really, really helpful as a way of, I guess, a guide really to coach them into these ideas of CFT, but also cultivating their compassion itself. So, um, so yeah, we've been very excited about the process. Well, I'll add all the links so people can go and have a nosy because that sounds like a very valuable tool. And, and what are you working on at the moment? What's, where's, next you mentioned organizational stuff are you writing a new book or what, what's happening <laughs> <laughs> i made a promise to my wife uh, after my last book uh, cft for difficult emotions that i wouldn't write another one for uh, uh, uh quite a long time and so i'm still very happy in this moment of, of not necessarily writing things i, I don't know I have ideas. <laughs> not many people no, but I'm writing a book at the moment. I'm just halfway through, so I'm a bit obsessed about people's right. writing um, routines. It's intense, isn't it? It's very intense. I mean, I, I love writing the books, but it's very intense. It takes much, much longer than you ever think it's going to take. Uh, it's it's hard, hard work, but I, I think there's something about really going in depth into that and really focusing your mind on it that I really appreciated and I've learned a lot as sure as you are really learned a lot by spending that time and just dedicating yourself to one thing um but I'm also really appreciative of, of not been writing at the moment and uh and that I will come back to it in the future I've got some ideas for books and we're at some stage we'll need to do the second edition of the compassionate mind workbook so we're we've kind of got that in our minds but um I think the bit that I've been trying to do uh, particularly over COVID uh partly with the app uh, trying to spread, you know, the idea so anyone anywhere in the world can just click on the App Store or Google Play and be able to get a copy of the app. But we also developed a um, self-compassion course. So during COVID, I got really interested in some of the wonderful work that Paul and others have done on compassionate mind training, but particularly brief compassionate mind training. And so I developed a, an online uh, course, which is uh, four sessions long, and each session is only 30 minutes. We tried to make it really accessible. And essentially, it's me on film sort of talking people through the system model and basic stuff to do with uh, compassion. And then each session has at least one practice uh, as part of that 30 minutes. And then people get access to audio recordings and some uh, writing on the, the, the session they've just done. So I've been really excited about that course because, again, it's just another way for people to access the ideas of compassionate mind training. And again, wherever they are in the world that they can you know, sign up and log on. And so... We've been doing some studies on that. So we had a lovely study with some clinical psychology trainees at UCL. And we had some fantastic outcomes from people taking this four-week course. But now we've got a study going on at the moment uh, of using this four-week course with uh, nurses uh, on the front line in a busy hospital. We've got it for people struggling with diabetes. Uh, we're going to have another one, hopefully looking for people using it for struggling with OCD. So again, just trying to find different ways of taking the CFT model and spreading it out. So that's kind of a big focus for me at the moment. Uh, I guess a major one, how do we just uh, disseminate these ideas and, and find different modalities, I guess, whether it's you know write, uh, reading a self-help book, whether it's using the app, using an online course, just finding ways to do that. So that's, I guess, one section and one sort of uh, chunk of what I'm doing at the moment. And I guess the other section is, yeah, what I mentioned to you is about... Um, uh, compassion in organizations and this came from gosh work that I was doing maybe 10 years ago or so uh, where I, I started to do CFT not uh, CFT stuff partly in within the NHS and organizations but also for some businesses and was of course just you know as you were talking about earlier you know how to use a free system model how to uh, uh, think about uh reducing unnecessary threat system in organizations, how to help people to sustain drive system, but also, of course, how to create psychological safeness and cultivate the green system. And so uh, I set up, uh, I met a, a wonderful colleague of mine, James Ina, 
who was a, uh, a consultant who was already working in businesses uh, and helping CEOs and doing coaching and so on. And she had come to CFT and absolutely loved it and felt that this was such a powerful model and really was keen to try and spread this into organizations. So we got talking and started putting some ideas together. So our company is called uh, BALO, which stands for Balanced Organizations, as in balance of the three system model. And so we, uh, we're going to be launching soon, but we've been doing a sort of soft launch. So Jamesina has been doing some wonderful work within organizations already with CEOs and leaders using compassion focused coaching and using the CFT model. We've done some nice workshops for uh, different uh, employees about their compassionate minds and how to cultivate uh, uh, self-compassion, but also compassion for, for each other. And, uh, and also doing some nice modules at uh, Cambridge University for their uh, business courses. And, uh, you know, so we've got some nice stuff that's already starting. And then hopefully in due course, we'll be rolling out a whole range of different things that would be hopeful. So I'm really passionate about this. It feels, yeah, this is just another way of really beginning, as you said earlier, to get in there and, and change these cultures from these old cultures of organizations in which it's only about producing more stuff and, and basically employees just have to work harder and just produce this thing and instead of moving to we're this idea for, of we're going to be working for much longer now aren't we and our work and home lives are kind of overlapping because we're in a different way we don't just finish at five but also the feels like there's a lot of fear around mental health like what is it and just this huge fear and actually you know just as we have physical health we have mental health and we just you know we need a, a new way of talking about it and it, what an amazing place to start in organizations I think that's very exciting we spend a lot of time as you're, as you're touching on there Sarah I think it's such an interesting point isn't it that you know this idea that we could be in workplaces that are the source of suffering yeah and that actually given that you know workplaces are relational how we can actually cultivate, you know, caring, supportive workplaces in which actually when you're there, you know, you feel that you're cared about and supported and that, you know, people are bothered about your well-being. And and lo and behold, of course, all the studies that are coming out that, you know, suggest that if you do feel cared for and supported and, you know, that you matter at work, that, you know, not only do you end up staying there longer, you have less sick days and that, you know, you're more passionate and committed to, you know, the, the, you know, the company that you're working for. So, so again, those things. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Those types of things feel really exciting to me and really, again, just another way of spreading Paul's wonderful model and just trying to reach as many people as possible with it. Very exciting. And the question that I ask everybody at the end is, if we could take you back to your 15-year-old version of Chris Irons, what would you say to him? (laughs) It's a wonderful question and there's, uh, uh, gosh, there's so many different things that I would say to him. but I guess what if I was thinking of a major one, really, I think um, my mom, I always remember my mum saying, um, "Youth is wasted on the young," mm. and I think there's something about that in which, of course, when you're 15 years old and you're caught up in the you know the sort of puberty and you know shame and gosh, you know, so many you know sort of things about how people view you and so on. I think if I could know or at least have some more knowledge of what I now know about shame and what it does to you and uh, uh, how it can inhibit you as a person in terms of who you are and what you want to do and how you spend your time and and how you are with other people. Um, I think if I knew what I knew now and how compassion can be such a powerful way of shame resilience in a way of being in the presence of these things, not further shaming yourself for it but understanding why it's normal and it's okay but also being able to have I guess the the courage to tolerate it and the wisdom actually to to know that um while shame might tell you certain things are true that it doesn't mean that they are true and that actually beginning to find uh, uh you know if at that stage I was able to be more caring and supportive to some of those concerns I had and find more ways I guess to either tolerate them but also to share them with other people people who I knew cared for me but I don't know if it's the same for you Sarah when shame grips me and, and I certainly see it in others it kind of blocks you to the potential uh, compassion and, and in a way other people's soothing systems so you end up getting trapped into this sort of internal threat system world so definitely if I could go back and be a, a kind of compassionate coach to that younger version of me 
uh, if I could dial down shame a little bit and, and actually just be able to be in the world a little bit freer from that, uh, I think that would have been a really lovely thing and, and actually would have freed me up uh, in, in so many different areas of my life. Uh, yeah. But I guess the major thing really is, is that you can come to that knowledge at some stage, <laughs> even if it is a little bit later on in life, but that's better than nothing. So I'm pleased that I've, I've kind of got there, or at least getting towards something like that uh, yeah. in my 40s now. So that's, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you so much today. I really thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I know so many people are going to as well. And I know people are going to want to find out more ab- about you and where's the best place to follow you or find out more about the amazing work you're doing. Um, so our, uh, the major website for us is, is Balanced Minds. So that's www.balancedminds.com. So uh, you'll see on the website more about me, but also what we're trying to do there, which is to provide uh, CFT to individuals. So we're very proud that I think we are the, the Outside of the NHS, the single biggest provider of compassion focused therapy in the world. So we've been wow. really proud of just to get this out there. We have yeah. wonderful colleagues doing fantastic CFT work. We've also got um, uh, within that, though, uh, uh, you know, sort of providing supervision for other uh, uh, clinicians and, and sort of a training program. So that's the sort of second bit, you know, how to give people ways into learning about compassion mind training and the CFT model. And then the third bit that we've got there is the self-help stuff, the CFT self-help. So uh, if people take a look at that, hopefully they'll find out more about what we're trying to do and, and a little bit more about me. And then on social media, probably on Twitter. Uh, so I'm Dr. Chris Irons on there. So it'd be wonderful to hear from people. And But no, thank you so much, Sarah. It's a real pleasure to be here, real privilege to be invited on. Uh, I think your podcast is fantastic and I can't wait to hear about your book. Uh, are you able to say a little bit about it now or are you keep it under that? I think I can. It's, um, it's built um, for therapists in private practice. Um, so setting up and building private practice and building a value-based business. So that's that's what I'm doing. I'm four chapters in, another six to go. And it's intense and bigger than what um, Mary Welf was helping me and, and coaching me compassionately. And that's she was she kind of was saying to me this is going to be bigger you're going to need more time I'll fit it in I'll be fine it's absolutely consuming but I really I love the process of writing but then I read back what I've read and I think oh my god and then it's it's structuring (laughs) so I know that feeling so I had many times when I'd read back my writing and think which idiot wrote this then it was me so so you can't really get away from it but I love the sound of this book and and certainly I know when we were setting up Balanced Minds I would have loved to have have read a book like that because it would have been so helpful to have that wisdom and knowledge at the time so I'll look forward to uh, to getting a copy and uh, yeah Yeah. Mary's a great person to have supporting you along the way yes yeah she's putting up with a lot at the moment as are lots of people around me as you (laughs) And so I'll be having a break. But I do like being a little right in a writing hole as well at times. It's very nice. And, oh, thank you so much, Chris. That's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you for listening to As a Therapist. For more information about the CBT journal, visit my website at saradreese.co.uk. You can also sign up to download your free guide to building emotional resilience, delivered straight to your inbox. You will then also receive regular newsletters where I share my blog posts, podcasts and tips and strategies for better mental health and psychological resilience. Don't forget to review and subscribe to the podcast and you can also share episodes on social media using the hashtag AskTheTherapist. This episode was written and presented by me, Sarah Rees, and edited by Big Tent Media and produced by Emily Crosby Media.